<laughs> That's why I'm so white now. <laughs> I am thankful that her tenure line opened up, though. So, um, yeah. um, <laughs> that, that's the one I wanted. Um, but, you know, in, in a very broad sense, you know, her research concerns uh, the politics of environmental change uh, and conservation. And her work contributes um, to theoretical discussions um, across the disciplines um, in political ecology, environmental anthropology, and more broadly speaking, post-humanist uh, philosophy. So she's done ethnographic research um, in the Florida Everglades, most notably as a uh, co-PI on the FCE LTR program, uh, which is the Florida Coastal Everglades Long-Term Ecological Research Program. It's one of the university's sort of like um, sort of preeminent research programs that they have. It's been running since 2000, and Laura helped establish the social science um, component of that research network. Um, and a running joke, you know, I've um, sort of, once again, you know, just like the tenure line, I had to come in and um, sort of, you know, help, you know, sort of follow on Laura's work that she's been doing at the FCE project. Whenever you work with people on this network, if you just say, well, Laura suggested this, then immediately everyone just goes along with what they say. I wish that worked at home. I wish that worked at home. I know, right? Exactly. <laughs> um, but anyway, so Laura has published um, two books based on her Everglades work. Um, in 2011, she published Sw Swamp Life uh, with the University of Minnesota Press, which received the 2013 James M. Blount uh, Memorial Book Award um, from the Cultural and Political Ecology Specialty Group at the uh, Association of American Geographers meeting. Um, and then earlier, um, with Glenn Simmons, published the book Gladesmen, Gator Hunters, uh, Moonshiners, and Skippers, um, published with the University of Florida Press. Um, so she's also the author of numerous uh, single and co-authored publications, um, and recipient of numerous uh, grants for her work as well. Now she's currently doing work with urban communities um, in Baltimore and the U.S. cities and is in the middle of a long-term um, project in Tierra del Fuego, Chile. And her research in Tierra del Fuego is exploring the ways um, that introduced species are remaking the landscape and the ethics of living and dying in a changing world. I think we're going to hear more about that today. So please join me in welcoming Al Lorado. Thank you. Thank you for that lovely um, introduction. I, I want to thank the department, um, uh, SAGSA, as well as the Institute of Water and, uh, and the Environment for this opportunity to share my current work. I am going to be talking today about a project that I've been working on since about 2011 in uh, Chilean Tierra del Fuego, which is the archipelago of, of the islands at the very bottom of South America. Um, this this project, um, and also I just want to say it feels really great to be back really home in multiple ways. Like this department was my home for a long time, the place that so many things happened in my life. Um, and um, it's also the place I grew up. So it's, it's a really lovely in multiple ways to be here today. Um, today, the, the talk I'm going to uh, give um, examines the ways in which loss and change associated with colonialism exceed complicate and are silenced by concerns about global environmental change. Um, and as I said, this, this work is based on field work that I've been doing in the Fuegan Archipelago since about 2011. I started that work, that project when I was here. Um, and it's also, this is a, a part of a book that I'm, I'm currently finishing, hopefully in the next couple of months. I began this project in Tierra del Fuego interested in the ways in which environmental change, particularly related to invasive species, um, we're, we're transforming assemblages of life in the region. And over time, um, as most long-term research does, uh, the project really morphed considerably. Um, and the part I'm going to be talking about today is, is about, um, comes out of a, a three-year or so collaborative research project. It's a collaborative archival project also with um, the Yagan indigenous community that live on Navarino Island, which is the southernmost village in the world. The talk has three interconnected parts. It begins with loss um, and um, ends with wonder. Part one, the earth as archive. Each of these parts has a little concept that I'm playing with. Loss seems to define our present era, particularly losses associated with environmental change and climate change. Best-selling books from Elizabeth Colbert's The Sixth Extinction to Amitav Ghosh's The Great Derangement frame the present as a moment in world history where catastrophic losses exceed our imaginative capacities. Each day it seems that we are facing another species lost to extinction or a coastline threatened by rising seas. <clears throat> 
course, we know about that here. The cultural critic Roland Barthes wrote a memoir about loss after his mother died. In one entry, he described this loss as, quote, a flat, dreary country, virtually without water, and paltry. Of course, of late, loss does not feel like a dry and empty desert. Instead, loss feels soggy. If a loss feels like a landscape of wet clothes, of moldy drywall. Loss is a place where trees and washing machines and playhouses have been swept aside by the tides of repeated hurricanes. Loss is not just an event, like something or someone now is gone. Instead, loss is ongoing. It transforms who we are, how we relate to other beings and things, as well as our hope for the future. The islands of the Fuegian archipelago are in a constant state of loss and change. They are like fragments of land that are broken off from South America's continental tip. When you're on those islands, it kind of feels like there's no way to put stuff back together. Instead, the islands of the Fuegian archipelago seem to be barely holding their ground against the rough marriage of the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans. Generations of slow-moving glaciers created the archipelago's topographic features, which you can see on the screen. Once the Strait of Magellan, which is right there, was solid ice. Later, during the Little Ice Age, numerous icebergs clogged the channel, endangering the passage of Spanish merchant ships. Today, blue, ice blue glaciers reach down from the high peaks of the southern Andes into these waterways. These glaciers and their ever-changing contours are, are reminders of loss and change in the archipelago, here as they are elsewhere. Melting glaciers have their ripple effects. Already, indigenous communities from the Bering Sea to coastal Louisiana are in the process of relocating. In the Fuegian archipelago, algal blooms smother fish and prevent fishing. As communities begin to pack up and leave, they sacrifice much more than houses, schools, shops, and livelihoods. For place-based people, the seas are forcibly claiming their past, sacred sites, and the resting places of kin, both human and non-human. Loss has become, as I say in my book, the affective register of our time. But if, if loss is the affective register of our time, what is this time and how do we know it? For geoscientists and others, the Anthropocene has become a way of marking this time of loss and of naming the present. There's lots of kind of debates about that, and, it's not, and those aren't that interesting to me. A more interesting question to me, is, at least, is how do we know we are in a new time? This is an epistemological question because it's about what counts as evidence. In the most obvious sense, natural history museums and seed banks have become kind of archives of extinction. Zoos have become, and I like to think of, kind of last-ditch asylums for endangered species and their genes. Yet the Earth itself has become the most compelling archive of the present. Petrochemical traces in ice and soil act as depositions, literally, of an Earth distinct from the Holocene. These are called stratigraphic signatures, um, and they leave little doubt about the, that the Earth itself has changed. There are radioactive residues from nuclear testing that can have created a kind of global signal of the Cold War's bomb spike. Novel materials such as aluminum, concrete, and plastics now characterize our rocks, our soil, and our sea, as this image shows. Ice cores and tree rings now register the shifting concentrations of atmospheric CO2. Yet the Earth as archive produces a particular history of the present that emerges through geographic, geological time scales to produce a common world saturated by loss. Concerns about climate change and species extinctions often present these phenomena as global, shrouded by a dark and menacing cloud. Seeing the Earth and our future as uniform is a trick of scale or perspective, as Anna Singh has described, which makes us, quote, ignore, not see the heterogeneity of the world. As an anthropologist, I understand that time is not universal and that losses are rarely equally distributed. We know that in this room, of course, um, that the present is not only the result also of global environmental change, 
We also understand the making of the present includes losses of life, territory, and multi-species ways of being. This is what Heather Davis and Zoe Todd have recently called the severing of relations that is colonialism. Yet the traces of these losses are less visible in the strata of the earth and can instead be found elsewhere. Within conservation communities, the Fuegian archipelago is mainly valued for its stark wilderness and its importance to the history of modern science. For example, in this image you're looking at here on the screen, you can see a bunch of students sitting around learning about environmental ethics on Navarino Island in a course that was called Following Darwin's Footsteps. I was part of that course. Um, Darwin came to the region in 1832. Where they're sitting, the Beagle Channel flows behind them, and the mountains further back is called the Darwin Range. These topographic features are important as they indicate the ways in which the history of science, particularly Darwin's legacy, become inscribed upon the landscape of Tierra del Fuego. I call these claiming, ways of claiming territory, I call them inscription practices. The students are here really to learn about what is called now the Cape Horn Biosphere Reserve. It's a biosphere reserve. Um, and the biosphere reserve is also part of the traditional territory of the Yagan indigenous community. Like most conservation efforts, the biosphere reserve justifies its territorial claims through concerns over loss. In this case, though, the losses are twofold. One, to the region's very famous miniature forests, and literally they are, they're made, it's like moss and lichen, like literally miniature forests, as well as concerns about the Yagan community. When you're in the forest, with, which is really quite fun, it's like being in a, like a, I don't know, I always think of like a, a little trolls running around because the forest really is miniature. But when you're in there, Throughout, there are little placards put up, um, such as the one on the screen, which offer ethnobotanical interpretations of forest biota. And these, is, uh, these signs identify plants and animal species in four different languages, Yagan, Spanish, English, and Latin. Now, for the managers of the Biosphere Reserve, this is a political act. It's a technique of making present, um, used to make certain kinds of ethical claims about multicultural and multi-species worlds. But when you're there, this way of asserting a Yagan for it, presence in the forest seems merely to magnify their absence. For example, there is only one speaker of the Yagan language left in the world, so all of these interpretive signs actually signal and mark a profound loss. On the beach, just beyond the forest, lichens cover the rocky shore. Lichens live a very long time, hundreds to thousands of years. You guys, that's video of lichen, which is like a little joke to myself because, of course, they don't move. So <laughs> just watch it. It's really amazing. I just spent hours and hours videoing lichen. But lichens live a very long time. They don't move, and they live hundreds of th to thousands of years. That, uh, coupled with their slow growth rates, have made lichens an important way of marking the passage of time. Some scientists suspect that the fungi in lichen are immortal. Here, lichens claim their territory in color-coded patterns that extend from the water to the very edge of the splash zone. And this happens all throughout the Arctic regions. Lichens actually grow along the beach in these layered colored patterns from, um, it's like orange, you know, black, orange, and white. And, and, it, and it relates to how far away they are from the, from the water itself. But we might understand these patterns of lichen presence on the landscape as another form of territorial inscription. Almost 200 years ago, Darwin and the crew of the HMS Beagle strode across this very beach. Here, they dropped off some yagans that they had kidnapped and taken um, to England the year before. They probably walked across this ver these very lichen. Let us pause for a moment to consider how significant this event was in the history of the making of the present. Here, where the Beagle Channel laps against lichen-covered rocks, we see where different inscription practices meet though operating at profoundly different temporal scales. I'm going to come back to this beach at the end of my talk, but for now at least, we see how landscapes of loss, at least from the standpoint of the conservation community, contain multiple worlds and multiple temporalities that are often silenced 
by discussions of global environmental change. Part two, dermatoglyphs, traces of being. Now, most of the archival material that I've used in my project comes from the collected papers of, of Colonel Charles Wellington Furlong, who was an American explorer who traveled throughout the Fuegian Archipelago at the turn of the last century. Throughout these materials, which are kept at Dartmouth College, and I can tell you I found out about them, but somebody in Chile told me about them. Throughout these materials, Furlong describes himself as, quote, the first American and the second white man to explore the interior of Tierra del Fuego. We don't really need to unpack that phrase, but it is interesting. I like the second part. <laughs> Furlong was well aware that during the time of his explorations, colonial settlement was decimating the region's indigenous peoples. And this was his primary reason for going. In some respects, his research was motivated by a desperate attempt to document peoples thought to be going extinct at the time, which is something in anthropology we would, have, we would now refer to as salvage anthropology, not in a good way. That said, during the time span between Darwin and, Fue and Furlong's visit, which was about 70 years, both European disease and outright murder led to about an 80% decrease of the population of Yagan and Selknam people. Today, there are about 70 Yagan people living on Navarino Island um, on a reserve right outside the Biosphere Reserve. The Furlong collection at Dartmouth contains 40 boxes of journals, random notes, photographs, receipts, sound recordings, multiple, multiple, multiple copies of any article he ever read. He did not know how to just like keep one. It's vast, as you can see from this photo um, on the screen, um, which was taken in the early 1960s when Furlong and his wife, who was the unpaid secretary, of course, were curating this collection. Now, several colleagues of, of mine in Chile asked me to report back to them on the materials, um, as they were really anxious to find out what was here and what was there and what could be useful. And looking over the collection, uh, comprehensive finding guide, which is the thing that tells you what's in an archive, I noticed one box containing something called dermatoglyphs. Um, since I had never seen that word before, I started there. What I found was manila folder after manila folder containing the foot and hand prints of Yagan and Selknam men, women, and children. The study of foot and hand prints dates back to the eugenics area of science, era of science, though it, is, it had a brief resurgence for some reason I don't quite understand in the 1960s within biological anthropology. Dermatoglyphs means literally skin curving, though the translation should be traces of being, in my opinion. These prints evoke loss and presence kind of simultaneously. Um, and encountering these dermatoglyphs, it's, it was very jarring. And the only thing I can remember, like the way I always think about it was that one time, um, uh, just a couple months after my mother died, I, I pushed the button on the answering machine to, and I erased it accidentally. And like her voice like just disappeared forever. And something that like absence and presence play um, was kind of like what seeing these dermatoglyphs is like, for me at least. Now, a month after encountering the furlong dermatoglyphs, I shared them with members of the Yagan community on Navarino. Now, in, in addition to the dermatoglyphs, um, as I said, there's tons and tons of photographs. There's actually thousands of photographs of Yagan and Selknam people that were taken at that time. And so for several days, I projected all those images on the wall of the community center. And it was very slow going because everyone wanted to stop and really look at each photograph, trying to figure out if these were kin. Now, on the first morning, though, when I was walking over to the communi community center, I was really, really anxious about showing these images of these dermatoglyphs. I worried about them because they, they really have a lot of detached racism in them. I worried about how they would reflect on me and my institution that we had them. Like, on so many levels, I was really like, uh, these dermatoglyphs, what am I going to do about it? So when we got to them in the presentation, I like spent all this time explaining them, blah, blah, blah. But surprisingly, at the, at the time, but not now, no one really cared about them. <laughs> Instead, people just wanted to talk about the photographs. But I'll come back to why I think that's so. All forms of, trace, uh, all forms of inscription leave their traces. There's a, the French, there is, the French philosopher Jacques Derrida, of course, wrote a lot about traces in archives. Um, in his work, he warns that we should not be lulled into thinking that traces somehow provide access to a fixed past 
or origin. That's in contrast to the etymology of the term trace, which includes the idea of the footprint. But Derrida did not really conceive of a trace as a kind of clue or piece of evidence, like, like something from an Agatha Christie novel. This point is important metaphysically as well as evidentiary, because it's, it's about how we know the past and thus the present. What kind of traces help us know that? Or to what degree is the past and future knowable through fragments? Well, I would say contrary to Derrida, what I've learned from hunters working with hunters for the last couple of decades is that there is a reliable predictability in certain kinds of traces. For example, between a, a print of an animal in the mud and, the, a, and its, its place in space and time. And according to Furlong's field notes, the first, uh, the first American and second white man, um, his Selknam guides were really amazing trackers. They could follow footprints through mo moist moss. They could identify an individual people who they were tracking just from their footprints. Now, uh, Francis Galton, who was Darwin's cousin, you see I just keep coming back to Darwin, it's, it's impossible not to, wrote the definitive guides to dermatoglyphs, actually. And in that guide that he wrote that came out in the 1920s, he was really unsure about the utility of imprints for characterizing race, which is, of course, why he wanted to study them. Yet apparently, the Selknam could distinguish the footprints of a white person from that of another Selknam. That said, while the predictability of tracks and other fragments of evidences are comforting, not all traces work that way. Some traces slip away from our get grasp just at the moment when we are trying to make sense of history and ourselves in the process. Dermatoglyphs are much closer to Derridian traces than clues in a detective story, even though they feel like evidence of a crime scene. Well, and they are in some ways. Derrida presents us with a contradiction. He describes the trace as a kind of the absence of presence. This is very unclear, which is true about all of Derrida's work. It's very unclear. But, but it is exactly this kind of ambiguity which is unsettling about these dermatoglyphs. They mark presence and absence simultaneously. Almost a year after my presentation to the community, Francisco Filguera, who is a community yaga and community member, um, and uh, Alberto Serrano, who helps run a museum there in the community, they came to Dartmouth to work in the archives with me for several weeks. During that time period, we tried to photograph every single piece of I uh, item in the collection. Um, and this was really exhausting. We ended up with about 10,000 images, uh, high resolution images. Uh, most of the time, when we were doing this work, we kind of joked around like jaded doctors in a triage unit, because we're just literally like barreling through what felt like an endless catalog of the disappeared people, language, ways of being in the world. Then we found an imprint of a yaga and infant's hand and foot on the screen. When we opened up its, its manila envelope and it was on the table, my Francisco, he held the document in his hands and he looked at us. Alberto and I, we leaned a little closer to him at that moment, the way that people who are kind of friends but not really friends kind of touch and don't touch. I'm not trying to be melodramatic because I'm not at all, but instead what I'm trying to describe is just a flutter of sorrow that left us quiet for a moment. These baby imprints stall things just for a second. This is the affective register of the artifact. And it does not come across on the screen, which is perhaps why in the community center no one was really that interested in them. The actual dermatographs, though, when you're holding them in your hand, they're not just copies of the body, they are also of the body. They register the touch of an infant's hand, and in doing so, they touch us. Over a century ago, at a missionary outpost in the southernmost village in the world, Furlong, there on the screen, <laughs> pressed ink-stained hands and feet onto sheets of clean white paper. In those moments of intimate contact, skin cells mix with ink. The cardstock is infused with traces of another, as well as dirt and sand. This is a windy place. These dramatic lifts are an example, a different kind of example, of the Earth as archive. 
in that they archive the earth's dust and they trace of hands and feet that once touched and knew the earth. Three, last section, wonder the earth. Wonder as a term has a lot of intellectual baggage to it, to say the least, particularly in the history of science and scientific exploration. Uh, we'll just leave that there. That said, though, in my, my own project in this book I'm writing, I'm defining wonder as a kind of disposition, um, particularly about being curious about other worlds, but also about the possibility of alternative futures. So throughout this book, it, there's a lot about loss, but there's also a lot about wonder, too. This is a photo of the most important contemporary landscape for the Yagan community on Navarino Island called Mejillones. On this site, um, there is actually the only chouse, which is a, like a structure for the initiation of young people into Yagan learning. It's also a place where the eldest and last speaker of the language was born and where she will go when she dies. I went there with, some fr with my friend Francisco who came to Dartmouth and a, and a bunch of other people. He has this um, tourism bus that he takes tourists around. It's a big bus. And there was a bunch of teenagers in the back and they were doing um, um, karaoke, listening to Justin Bieber. Um, and then we were in the front, sitting in the front, the grown-ups were in the front talking and drinking mate and just catching up and joking around. Everyone jokes around and drinks, gets jacked up on mate there. But as we pour, pulled into Mejillones, which is right there, I said something that was kind of dumb, like, you know, you just sort of say something because you want to make fill space. And I said, um, you know, those are really, the, the sea, the blue water is really pretty against those mountains <laughs> and sky. And Francisco, he stopped for a moment, just for a minute, and he said, those mountains, well, Darwin was just a terrible person, really horrible, at least for us. Everything Darwin, it's offensive. For the Yagan, it's offensive. Wherever you go, the Darwin range looms large. It's a palpable and a constant presence. Now, Francisco's comment might have been a quick aside, but I don't think so. There's a book by uh, the anthropologist Michael Tausick that's called My Mises and Alteri. It came out a really long time ago. But in it, he reminds us that the Fuegians had two very different words for white, two different words for whites they encountered in the 19th century. And both of these words translate to people of the mud or earth. I was thinking about that when I was at Mejillones as I, got, I, as I was gazing across an earth that seems to have been remade by and for these mud men. Now, Charles Darwin visited Tierra del Fuego in 1832 when he was serving famously as the naturalist on the voyage of the HMS Beagle. On his voyage to Tierra del Fuego, there were three young Fuegian indigenous captives on board ship with him. These people that the captain had already named were called Jimmy Button, Fuegia Basket, and York Minister. Um, and there was, a, uh, there was a, a, fourth, a fourth young man called Boat Memory, which is like a name that we should just stop for a minute about, who died of smallpox while in England. Now these people, um, uh, the, the Jimmy Button, Fuege Basket, and York, uh, York Minster, were being returned to the Cape Horn area after being kidnapped and taken the year before to England on the Beagle's first trip. In Tierra del Fuego, as I think I've tried to point out, one encounters traces of Darwin at every turn. The southernmost ex extent of the Andes, as I said, is called the Darwinian Range. The highest peak of Tierra del Fuego is the Mount Darwin. Um, the, there's the Darwin Sound, which is right off of the Beagle Channel. Um, and there's lots and lots of species named after Darwin there as well. For example, there's this miniature, incredibly adorable miniature um, ostrich that runs around all crazy that's called the uh, Darwinian Rhea. Now, there was an anthropologist called Anne Chapman who was quite amazing, and she worked in the Fuegian archipelagos during the 1960s. There she is with a little baby Wanako, which is kind of like a, a llama. Um, and she spent, though, the last decade of, or more of her life, literally, like she gave up the last decade of her life from 19, like she was like in her mid-70s to about 90 years old, um, researching and writing a book about European encounters with the Yagan. 
Now her goal in this book, which is enormous, was to reverse the ways in which the Yagad had become almost synonymous with their encounter with Darwin, rather than having a history and an identity of their own. For Darwin, the Yagan were not only savages in his writing, they existed in another temporal dimension, that of evolutionary time, somehow stalled in the slow progress toward modernity. As he said, as Darwin said, quote, viewing such men, one can hardly make oneself believe that they are fellow creatures and inhabitants of the same world. For a century or more, Darwin's description of the Yagan as savages and the wildest people on earth profoundly shaped European encounters with the indigenous peoples in the region. And they continue to define how the Yagan are known today. I wish I had that Wanako as a pet. So yeah. cute. It would be bad in the house, though. A few days after visiting Mejillones, I went with some other community members on a boat cruise around the coast to view other important Yagan sites. This here is uh, a place called Wulaya, um, and it's the actual spot where Darwin's ship dropped off Jimmy Button and the other Fuegan captives right here. Now, when I was there, um, uh, um, uh, one of the reasons I wanted to go there was because Furlong in the journals was really obsessed with Wulaya and Darwin, and he just, he, he has nine notebooks that I spent about three months transcribing. They're very tiny. Um, and in them, like a mantra, he tells the story, like, just in oddball places over and over again about Walaya and about Darwin and about the Yagans being dropped off here. But this, and also for another reason, um, which Furlong writes about, and that's because this place is also famous for something called the Allen Gardner Massacre. This is where there was once a very large Yagan village. Jimmy Button lived there. Um, and Jimmy Button was supposed, supposedly led an uprising against the crew of a ship called the Allen Gardner. Now that ship was also returning back with some Fuegian kidnapped, I mean some Yagan kidnapped people, but this time from the Falklands in another effort at missionizing um, indigenous people. Now Furlong, as I said, was really obsessed with Darwin and the Allen Gardner, and that's why, that's why he went there. But when I was there with my Yagan collaborators, we we're just standing there. There's very little trace of any of this history or of Yagan presence on the landscape at all, much less any traces of this kind of colonial and complicated colonial violence. But when we were working together at Dartmouth in the Furlong Archive, we came across lots of images of Wulaya. Um, And what you can see here, so when, when, when Furlong went to Ulaya um, in 1907, it, it was largely abandoned at that time. There were no Yagan people living there at that time either, because at that point it was the height of the genocide. And so Yagan people had left to, to, to most of them to live sort of what um, people describe as kind of at sort of sympathetic missionary outposts that were like sheep farms on the islands. Um, they really, uh, in reading more about them, they're kind of like refugee camps. So Yagan people are living mixed in with other people um, outside of these big sheep farms. And so when, when Furlong went there, this is what it looked like. Yet let's take a moment to see what Furlong's photos actually do reveal. One, the, most notably, abundant evidence of histories of occupation. So this hilly pattern here, see that? These are actually shell min mittens. Some of them are 20 feet high. Um, and these l watery lines right here, those are um, canoe drag marks that have been literally impressions made in the mud over repeated landings of canoes over hundreds of years. These are also inscription practices, right? They are ways of claiming and tracing territory. Um, and in this case, these inscription practices trace thousands of years of Yagan life in this place. <clears throat> From the photo I took on the left <laughs> and the photo um, on the right, you can see that these middens and canoe marks are no longer there. That's that circle um, where those middens would be today. 
Now, other practices of territorial inscription have silenced these traces. In the years since Furlong's visit, the Chilean state deeded this land to settlers who had just arrived at the time Furlong was here. He actually talks to these first settlers. In the subsequent decades, their pigs and their cattle uprooted and flattened the land, erasing all of these traces of Yagan presence, as you can see. For these reasons, my project collaborators are really drawn to these older images of Wilaya. Of the thousands and thousands of photographs we examined, these are considered the most critical. The photograph on the right reflects a landscape enlivened by Yagan deep time, assemblages of life. Middens and their canoe marks are not kin, but they are traces of kin and being in the world for people who experienced a profound rupture in knowing place through kin. These photographs of Walaya are a way of reinscribing territorial claims. This is my last one. Now it seems like I'm telling a story of the recuperation of colonial archives for other purposes. This would be an overstatement and nothing that I'm trying to claim at all. As with other, um, as recuperation or even thinking about that or a decolonial practice, I'm not claiming that at all either, uh, neglects the way in which archives continue, colonial archives such as these, continue to shape the way Yagan people live in the world as political and territorial subjects of Chile and the ubiquitous narratives that continue to consign Yagan being in the, to the past and to natural history. Most Chileans are unaware that there are people, indigenous people in the archipelago. Instead, this is a reminder that the earth archives multiple forms of coloniality, not just those associated with global environmental change. Darwin and his fellow mud men became sea and mountain. Cows and pigs enrolled in colonial assemblages remake the land in ways that silence Yagan history and presence. The stories about the Allen Gardner massacre continue to circulate endlessly. And yet not only, as Marisol de la Candena reminds, the earth here may be silenced, but it remains an archive of histories and temporalities that continue to shape being in the world. The entire coast of Navarino Island is hilly with histories of living that exceed colonial inscription practices. As this photo from a recent road project shows, those, that's a midden. Uh, Veronica, who's a Yagan community member who also works at the museum, um, and her job is to catalog bird skulls and Wanako bones from these sites. She begged me to take this picture, like she kept telling, bringing me to this road, this road project to take this picture. She just loves it. And what I learned from her was that there is wonder and strength in walking an earth that contains the traces of both loss and presence in the world. Thank you.